Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Ozempic. Ozempic, or semaglutide, is a drug used to treat type 2 diabetes. It was originally approved by the Food and Drug Administration in December of 2017, made by a powerhouse in the diabetes industry, Novo Nordisk. It's a glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist. It's sort of like Victoza and Trulicity. It's injected subcutaneously, kind of like insulin. It's only for type 2 diabetes, but it's not the first choice. The first choice always is diet and exercise, and then typically metformin, and then there are a variety of other medicines of which Ozempic is one. The drug was discovered in 2012. They did some studies in 2015 and 16. The Food and Drug Administration Advisory Committee voted 16 to 0 in favor of the drug in October of 2017, then December they approved it. It is only for type 2 diabetes. It is not for type 1 diabetes and is not for people who have diabetic ketoacidosis. There are a variety of drugs in the same family. Given daily is Victoza. There are some others. In weekly therapy, there's Trulicity that you hear advertised a lot by Dorian. And then there's another one that was taken off the market recently, not because of any kind of specific problem, it's just because it wasn't a big seller. Well, the drug works by stimulating the production of insulin and decreasing the production of glucagon. The glucagon decreases by about 8 to 10 percent under normal circumstances, and after meals it decreases by about 15 percent, and it also works by causing a slight delay in the emptying of the stomach. Now, how does it work on your blood sugar? Well, if you look at the fasting sugar, in those people who are taking Ozempic, it goes down about 29, 30 milligrams. So that's a significant amount. But if you're starting off at 250, mm, that's not quite enough. Postprandially, after you eat, it will reduce the rise in blood sugar by about 74 milligrams. Now, let's just say you start off, everyone talks about the A1C nowadays, hemoglobin A1C, glycosylated hemoglobin. If it starts off at about 8%, it's going to decrease with Ozempic by about 1.5%. About 70% of the people are going to be able to achieve a glycosylated hemoglobin or an A1C, of less than 7%. That's all very good. But remember, this is when we evaluate people who don't have very severe diabetes. So the fasting blood sugar went from 175 down by about 44 points. Okay, but that's not really something to write home about. It's not a very strong drug. If we look at people's weight, well, if you take the Ozempic, the weight might go down by about 10 pounds. Now, Ozempic frequently has to be combined with other drugs, drugs like metformin or the sulfonylureas or insulin. And again, it works about the same. It will reduce the glycosylated hemoglobin from about 8 or 8.5. It will reduce it by maybe 1.5%, maybe up to 2%. Maybe about half of the people, 60% of the people, are going to be able to achieve a glycosylated hemoglobin of less than 7%. But remember, these weren't really bad diabetics to start with. These are very mild diabetics who probably would have been able to do quite well with appropriate diet and exercise and not need the drug at all. And the weight, well, on average it was about 200 pounds and it fell by about 5 or 10 pounds. Now, there's been some pressure on their drug Victoza. That's still number one in the market, but Trulicity is gaining on it. So the company, Nova Nordisk, wanted to do something to achieve parity. Instead of the once a day shot, they wanted to go to a once a week shot. Well, they did that. And now they compare Ozempic to Trulicity. And it would appear that if we look at the mean baseline, the weight in people who are about 200 pounds, if they're treated with Ozempic, their weight is going to fall by somewhere between maybe about 10 and 17 pounds. And it seems that the people who are heavier, 
they achieve more of a benefit than the people who are lighter. If we look overall at the A1C, it's going to fall by about 1.5%. If people are given neozempic, if people are given the trulicity, it falls by a little more than 1%. Well, the reason people die of diabetes really is not because of the diabetes. The reason people who die who have diabetes is because of heart-related conditions, cardiovascular disease. Well, the first drug that was shown to have any potential benefit was Jardians. Jardians seemed to have a decrease in the overall cardiovascular events. Then Victoza in a trial called the LEADER trial in 2016 was shown to do basically the same thing. The Food and Drug Administration mandated that the company do the study because they decided that, hey, uh, the sugar lowering really isn't the be-all and end-all. What we want to do is, sure, reduce the sugar, but we want to make people live longer. So they made the Victoza people, Novo Nordisk, do a study, and it showed that it was pretty okay as far as the cardiovascular disease was concerned. It might reduce the risk of complications by a smidgen. So now they were required to look at the cardiovascular outcome in people who were taking Ozempic. And that was called the SUSTAIN-6 trial. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in November of 2016. It was sponsored by the company. It was performed by the company. It was monitored by the company. It was, uh, had the, the data collected by the company, the data analyzed by the company. So looking at it just simply by who's got their fingers in the pie, this should be a phenomenal study, and it should show that Ozempic really does well. It does great for your heart. Well, what was the study outcome? Looked at about 3,300 patients. They were given the standard dose, 0.5 milligrams once a week, or one milligram once a week. These patients were at high risk for cardiovascular disease. They looked at them for a couple years. The average age of the patient was 65. Most of them were white. Most of them had their diabetes for an average of about 14 years, and most of them were fat, or we call it now obese. These patients, about 80% had a history of cardiovascular disease, and the other 20% were at high risk. Well, the way they do outcomes on studies nowadays is they do what's called a composite endpoint. So they don't look at just heart attack. What they do is they look for the primary outcome at cardiovascular mortality plus non-fatal heart attacks plus non-fatal stroke. And when you look at those composite endpoints all together, it was found that people taking Ozempic, well, their risk of a primary event was 6.6% compared to 8.9% in people who were receiving the standard medicine plus a placebo instead of the Ozempic. The company says that was a decrease in 26% in the incidence of cardiovascular disease, the combined endpoint. You and I might say it's about 2.3%. But now let's look at the individual endpoints. Was there a significant difference? Was there a statistically significant difference, a reduction in the likelihood of cardiovascular-related death? Answer, no. How about non-fatal heart attacks? Were they reduced in incidence? Answer, no. How about non-fatal stroke? Borderline reduction. How about if we look at all-cause mortality? No statistically significant difference. Hospitalization for heart failure? No statistically significant difference. Hospitalization for heart failure or unstable angina? Again, no significant difference. But what they found was that new or worsening retinopathy, the eye disease associated with diabetes, well, Ozempic might be associated with some benefit problems in only a little less than 4% of the people who were taking Ozempic versus about 6% of the people who were receiving a placebo. On the other hand, complications of the retinopathy, Ozempic, about 3%, placebo, less than 2%. So in other words, it would appear that the complications of retinopathy were increased by about 75%. Complications of retinopathy increased about 75%.
in people who were receiving Ozempic. Now, they said, well, it might be because the sugar fell faster in people who were taking Ozempic. Or maybe it might have been a specific drug effect. Well, certainly people who have the diabetic retinopathy to begin with appeared to have a greater risk of hemorrhage into the vitreous and blindness and conditions that required use of laser photocoagulation of the eye. Remember, Ozempic. 3% placebo, less than 2%, 75% increase. Well, the company tried as hard as they could to evaluate and see what the heck the problem was. Well, they said that it looks like the people who had the complications might have had some more retinopathy to begin the trial with than the people who were in the placebo group. And they said, if you get rid of all of those people, well, maybe the incidence is about the same. Whether that's really the answer or not, can't say. But certainly the statistics hold for this drug. And also the same thing happened in Victoza. Well, what are some of the other cardiovascular effects and other effects? Ozempic might reduce the blood pressure more than placebo by about one, two, or three millimeters of mercury. Mm, that's a little bit, it sounds like, but certainly over society, that can significantly reduce the likelihood of cardiovascular disease. But on the other hand, heart rate is very important, and it seems that people taking Ozempic increase their heart rate by two or three points, two or three beats a minute. People who were receiving the placebo were more likely to require antihypertensive therapy and cholesterol lowering therapy. Treatment with the drug is relatively straightforward, like any other kind of injection, either the upper thigh or the abdomen or the upper arm. You rotate the sites. You can inject it at the same time, but not the same place as insulin. And certainly, if you have some kind of inflammatory problem at the site, don't, don't use the shot there. Use somewhere else. You start with 0.25 milligrams once a week. Do that for four doses and then increase to the maintenance dose, which typically is 0.5 milligrams once a week after four weeks after a month. If the sugar isn't what you want, then it can be increased to one milligram. It can go with or without food, doesn't make any difference. With or without other medicines, doesn't make any difference. It can go about, or you should give yourself a shot, about the same time every week. And if you miss a dose, then as long as you're not within two days of getting the next dose, then you can make the dose up. Well, you should store the medicine in the refrigerator. Don't put it too close to the cooling element. Don't put it in the freezer. After you use it, you can keep it at room temperature until you finish with the syringe, or you can put it back in the refrigerator. The peak concentration is after about one to three hours after the dose. The elimination time is a half-life is about a week. So there's some in your system for about five weeks after your last dose. It's relatively identical, about 94% identical, to the human GLP-1. The reason it has a long half-life instead of the body's GLP-1, GLP-1 is degraded very, very rapidly, but the injection isn't because it's bound to the albumin. It has decreased renal clearing. There's a little bit difference as far as the amino acid concentration is concerned. So it's protected from the enzymes that would otherwise degrade it. You don't have to worry about drug interactions with this drug. It doesn't seem to have any change that's necessary because of your age or your sex or your race or your ethnicity. It works in people who are relatively thin as low as 80 some odd pounds, up to people who are pretty fat, up to 400 pounds. The medicine works irrespective of how long you've had diabetes and doesn't seem to make any difference as far as your kidney function is concerned. There's a problem with pancreatitis. It seems to increase slightly the incidence of pancreatitis. So if you're taking the drug, and you have a history of pancreatitis, well, get off the drug. If, on the other hand, you have severe abdominal pain, especially pain that radiates to the back, especially if you have vomiting associated with it, sign you better talk to the doctor because you might have pancreatitis. It's unlikely by itself to cause hypoglycemia, but it certainly could when you combine it with other kind of drugs. There's little problem potential with the kidney, especially if you become dehydrated. 
Obviously, for hygienic reasons and for spread of disease, you shouldn't share the syringe even if you change the needle. We've talked about the problems with retinopathy. The government's a little concerned about that. And then there's the story about the potential for thyroid abnormality, something called uh, medullary carcinoma of the thyroid medullary adenoma or multiple endocrine neoplasia uh, syndrome that may occur. That's mostly in test animals, not in humans, but certainly if you're taking the drug and you develop a mass in your neck or dysfunction, uh, not able to breathe right or shortness of breath or you have some difficulty swallowing, well, certainly you need to talk to the doctor right away. The routine side effects are common with all drugs. You can have some nausea, but nausea occurring in up to 25% of the people may well be one of the reasons you lose the weight because you're nauseated. You don't feel like eating and vomiting occurs, again, in up to 25% or thereabout of those people who are getting the drug. Diarrhea, about 10%, abdominal pain sometimes, and constipation or fatigue or dizziness unlikely to have an allergic reaction. There's a slight increase in the production of amylase and lipase, meaning that there's little something is happening with the pancreas. Increase the heart rate slightly, as I said, delayed the gastric emptying time. Again, a reason that you would find that there's some weight loss associated with it. The incidence of hypoglycemia is increased about two or threefold in people who are taking either metformin or insulin or other blood reduction, uh, blood sugar reducing medicines. It's not appropriate for pregnancy, but we do know that people who are pregnant have a considerably greater incidence of major birth defects in the children. Under normal circumstances, about 2% or 3 or 4% of the general population. But if your HbA1c, the glycosylated hemoglobin, the A1c, happens to be more than about 7% before you get pregnant, then the likelihood of birth defects increases to about 6 to 10 percent, and it increases to 20 to 25 percent if you have significant diabetes, if your A1C is more than 10 percent before you get pregnant. Well, obviously, you should use some kind of medicine if you're diabetic, but this isn't one of them. You should stop this drug about two months before planned pregnancy. Well, if you're breastfeeding, again, there's no information, probably not appropriate. Pediatric, eh, it's not approved for people less than age 18. Geriatrics, older people, it's okay. People with renal impairment, liver impairment, again, it's okay. But we spend so much money on diabetes and diabetes therapy. Just the drugs alone, in 2002, were at $10 billion. By 2012, it increased to about $22 billion. The cost, the direct cost of taking care of diabetes is increased to considerably over $200 billion and is skyrocketing. The cost of Lantus, a type of insulin, a bottle of that, well, it went from $40 to over $400. Some people are paying more than $900 a month just for insulin. Now, if we look at the GLP-1 receptor agonists, if we look at Ozempic and the family, well, all of these drugs account for less than 10% of the diabetic care market. But Novo Nordisk, the company that makes this, wants to increase it, wants to boost the sales. They don't want to take the sales away from the daily Victosa. They want more people total, and they want people from Trulicity to switch over to this one. They estimate that the sales are going to be somewhere around $2.2 billion by 2022. And they're working on an oral ozempic so that you take it by mouth instead and it would appear at least in some of the early studies that it's probably at least as good or probably even better than Jardians. And then they looked at the drug as a treatment for obesity and they found that even in people who aren't diabetic there was a decreased hunger, decreased food craving and decreased body fat. But the study, again, has Novo Nordisk fingers in it. There were seven authors of the paper, and four of them, four of the authors, were from Novo Nordisk. And the study was very short. It only lasted about 12 weeks and only involved about 30 patients. But it was found that it did reduce the body weight. Well, is this an appropriate drug? Even though it was approved, 
in December, and it took them several months to get it on the market, so it was on the market in early 2018, they've already increased the price of the drug. By mid-July of 2018, the price was up about 8%. The company said that was to reflect the value that the medicine offers in the treatment of diabetes and has to do with current market factors. Well, if you go to the drugstore and you want to pay cash, it's going to cost you about $811. And if you have a coupon, well, it could be cut to $730, $740, $50, $60. So that's a pretty big sticker shock. But the company says that they'll give you a copay card so that you don't feel the out of pocket. They just want to take the money from the insurance company. And they give the insurance company a big bill, no out of pocket for you. Well, it would appear that Ozempic, even though it's heavily advertised, it's just another expensive alternative to going on an appropriate weight loss diet. And unfortunately, the weight loss diet or the diabetes associated diet, the American Diabetic Association diet, seems not to be the best for people who have diabetes. There's significant change afoot in the industry, and it may well be that people who have diabetes are better treated with a high-fat, high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet. Not high-carbohydrate, low-carbohydrate diet. That might be the best. Does it prevent complications? Does the drug prevent complications of diabetes? No, not apparently from the statistics that we have. Does it cure diabetes? No, doesn't seem to do that. Well, what's better if you happen to be overweight and you're facing an increased risk of heart disease and eye disease and kidney disease and every other kind of disease you can think of, including cancer? Would you rather take a drug that's going to reduce your blood sugar or would you rather take care of the potential for all of those other complications? Well, if you want to get rid of the complications, you better go on a really healthy weight loss diet. You better get some exercise. Those are still the primary avenues for good health associated with diabetes. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.